Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. In the early years of the Second World War, German submarines preyed on Allied shipping going from the United States to Europe. Um, the problem was sinking these German submarines. My guest today played a part in establishing communications to help sink German submarines. And as he said, after this took place, they couldn't put up a snorkel without getting a bomb dropped on it. My guest is Lewis Chapel of Paducah, and he spent time with this vital communication link in a rather exotic place that few people have ever visited, the Portuguese islands of the Azores. Welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you. First thing I want to start with, <clears throat> as you know, Portugal was neutral in World War II. How was it that the Allies were able to establish a military presence on these islands owned by a neutral nation? Uh, Portugal in the 13th century and Great Britain, the, the British Empire, had a, had a non-aggression pact between them. If anybody should attack them or, and Portugal acknowledged that they would help in any way they could, but they were neutral all during the war. So the British, uh, again, the Portuguese and the British, this treaty goes back to the Middle Ages. Yeah. Wow. Well, they established that, that reestablished that thing in October of 1943. And our outfit, in, uh, planning uh, in uh, Philadelphia, our engineers knew they, they were planning how to get to the Azores in that. So... We were the first um, uh, 23 men from our outfit, which was the 64th region of the Signal Corps. And you all left by ship from Norfolk, Virginia. Yes. And had no idea where you were going. Not until we were out at sea two days. And you discovered it was the Azores. Had you ever heard of the Azores before? Well, I'd heard of them when I went to school. In geography class, yeah. I knew they were named, called the Azores because there was a bunch of hawks that flew around the thing. And it's, it's what its name was, Hawk Island. Wow. Uh, so, but again, this was supposed to be a secret mission, you told me. But yet, on the way over, you discovered all about it in a magazine I got a flying magazine in the Azores in the uh, airport, the small airport they had there, uh, outlining the whole thing with maps and everything else, and it was secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. Describe what these islands look like, because we had talked before that they're very unusual in the, in the way they well, look. Well, there's nine islands. Only two of them or three have any size at all, but they're in groups of three. And those groups of three are three, 300 and 400 miles from the main thing. They are 800 miles from Portugal. Of course, they're 1,200 miles on some part of them. And they're 2,400 miles from New York City. Wow. And uh, you brought with you uh, some photos, some, some old and some new, of what the Azores look like. Uh, what struck me about it is the lack of just very few trees on the island at all. Well, there are nine islands, and there's only one island that's not volcanic. And the theory is that they were the mountain peaks of a of that largest mountain range that's in the world that's in the ocean, right out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Right. Uh -huh. And they came up there. Yeah, yeah. I believe you told me once before we were talking that there were no utility, you had to bring the utility poles to, to the Azores? Yeah. Well, there's no large trees there, like we had breakdown on us right. this last week. Right. Uh, but there's just shrubs. And uh, the island is rich in uh, volcanic dust and, and stuff, and they, 
they're self-sustaining and they're part of the Portuguese government, but they are what they call an autonomous mm -hmm. group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now well, that, now, how many poles did you bring? Do you remember? There's about 50. And then how did you get them from the ship to shore? Well, we couldn't go in ourselves to unload and, at a dock or anything because there had been set ducks for the submarines at that time. So we went over the side, down it, climbed down rope ladders and jumped into a Coast Guard, big Coast Guard boat. And we, we dropped our barracks bags of everything we owned first, but uh, you had to wait for the boat to swing towards you and get close to you. And when you dropped it, several of the boys lost all they had. Oh no, yeah. And then, then we went down in full, full, un full winter uniforms we were wearing and our, our carbines on our backs. And we had to jump in the boat the same way. Did anybody fall in the drink? Uh, two or three did and got pulled out. I don't, I think out of that whole bunch, any, there were some other Air Corps boys dropped with us too. Uh, I think I had one with had a broken arm mm. way he landed in the boat. Right, right, right. So the poles, did you all just drop them over the side? They dropped them over the side and the Coast Guard launch pulled them in there. Wow. And we, we put them up, up on the top of the mountain, which is where we installed them. I don't know how they got them up there through these little roads, but the Portuguese did somehow or other. Yeah. So then what were you to do with those poles? Well, we put the poles up and we put up air ground and uh, weather and radio range and, uh, and stuff like that. But before we had gotten there, the CBs were there and they were, they uh, removed a whole mountain ridge at the end of the runway so they could land the larger bombers there with a, a Liberator bomber, I think, that mm -hmm. they could B land. B-24, yeah. And th they engaged in anti-submarine patrols. Yeah. Because yeah. they could go a long way. Well, the Germans sunk more submarines right off the coast of New York and New Jersey than oh, anywhere yeah. else in the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, yeah, they were sinking ships all along there, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, somewhere, I believe, you, you had a picture of, uh, of each little dot on a map uh, that illustrated uh, a place where a, an Allied ship was sunk. Yeah. I haven't got that. I think. I have, did you put? Did they serve? Did they put that? Well, they'll up? show it. They'll, they can. They, 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 they will. They'll show it later. Okay. Um, you also had. You brought along some incredible photographs that were taken uh, uh, on the uh, uh, on the island uh, about uh, different things that you all were doing, including uh, running the bulls. Yeah. Which they do that in Pamplona, Spain. But I didn't know they did that in, in on the Azores. Well, uh, yeah, they did it. The reason I brought that picture was I was in the crowd that was running. <laughs> <laughs> another, another one of our boys that was up on the, up on the edge of the roof and the fence was took that picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There it is. That's a great picture. Yeah, and that's a tradition. Now that's now, a bull. That, that's a that's actually the bull fight. The bull lining fight. up. Yeah, yeah. And you went to the bull fight. Just this one. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's it. There you are. Can, can the, you pick yourself out in the crowd? No, I'm right in the center here of this bottom crowd. And, and a, a buddy that had a camera was up on that rooftop over there. Wow. Wow. That's quite an. Did the bull get any of you? No. You, you ran away from him? Well, they had. It, <clears throat> Not like in Spain. It was, it was a tame bull, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Just for he, show. He, he had his horn. His horns were nubbed, and they had a round brass knob on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do have pictures of a real bull fight that I didn't bring because it wasn't connected with this. But one of my teammates was on here, Theodosia Gomez, 
went to Spain, and he took the pictures of the thing. Uh -huh. But in that, you don't really see the bull when he gets thing because there's raised so much dust, you can't see that. Is that right? Huh. Another thing you told me about that one of the difficulties in, in laying this wire was you had to go down little roads and cut and because you couldn't go across fields. Yeah. Let's see if they bring that. Either one of those. Uh, the, the aerial views? Yeah. Yeah, of the little patchwork fields. Uh, that illustrates what you're talking about. Well, these little lanes, yeah, there. Uh, there we are. So the little lanes, are, are were they dirt well, or were they paved? Well, there's, there's only one st thing through there. Where You see where the houses are? That's the only road going through there. The rest of the things are packs and dots and everything. Yeah. And all those square things are stacked up with the lava that's down here along the edge of the ocean. Uh -huh. The stones. Uh -huh. And each one of those is, is they. And they're different crops of brown ones are plowed ground. Mm -hmm. And then they would do it after they raised wheat. They For the stubble, they'd put the cows in there for about a week before they cultivated again to fertilize it. That's clever. And they rotated crops and everything. Yeah. One of the, the, the things you had some really interesting photos was of corn, how they grew corn and how they, uh, how they, Hung it up to dry, which I've yeah. never seen that before. Yeah, if, if, if I show that in a minute. They will, they will, they will. Um, so they grew mostly wheat and corn when you were there? Yeah, and well, there they, it is. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, well, now that way they do that, they take the corn there and they dry it. And they shuck it except for two strands, and they take that and tie it on that thing. It's a, it's it's, it's just a framework, mm -hmm. like the Eiffel Tower almost. It's just full force. But anyway, they take that down to, they say here, uh, they uh, take it down to make cornmeal, and uh, they even feed their stock with it and, mm -hmm. and everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, now, where did you all stay on the island? In pyramid tents. In tents. I'll tell you, we got there on February the 6th at 4 o'clock in the afternoon when we got off the boat after they hauled all that stuff in. And the, they had set us up tents, pyramid tents, but they didn't do them. They were all flopping up the side of a hill. And we got our cots and everything got in. Then that night there came a storm. It rained and rained and rained and ran right down underneath our feet. <laughs> <laughs> but lucky we had lashed all the tents down and, and trenched them on the outside. But then we put our barracks bag on our cot, <laughs> set up and slept on that <laughs> during the storm. Wow. Was the weather pretty cold? Huh? Was the weather pretty cold? No, it never it never got cold. Yeah. That was February and it was 76 degrees. Wow. But when we installed the radio man, when it was installed, we took the transmitters that were in that coffin-like box and we, we took the lid off and, and one little side that was about 18 inches and the lid off. And then we put that in the tent and just fit a cot in there, so we had we were up off of the ground in that, and we took that lid and put it down in front of the cot, so we didn't have to stand in mud after wow. it dried. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, every first first we op opened everything up like that. We, every time we go out to the airfield, we come back at night. We'd bring one of those and fix somebody else up. Yeah, but yeah. We had we had about six men in a in a tent, three sides, and then about three in the middle. Wow. But it, it was comfortable. Yeah. Well, uh, as far as eating, did you have like a field kitchen or where did you eat? Well, they were installed there, 
at the airport, they had a regular mess oh. with the mess kit mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, my buddy from Tennessee, Ralph Fusen and I, we were the main radio men. When we got our temporary building up there to put the transmitters in, we stayed out there at night and worked on it when we had a, a diesel power out there and everything to get it on the air and they'd they'd bring us they'd bring us a meal on wheels <laughs> on <laughs> jeep wheels up there for it. yeah 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 um any german submarines around the island that people spoke about no yeah they were just farther out i guess no but that what we had that we had to run a keying line, we had to run a control of the transmitter up there from from, from the Lodge and Air Force Base. And uh, we had to go through there and we couldn't go through their field. We had to go down the line and that way. So it was five miles out there, but it took 15 miles of cable to get out there. And we had, I think, 39 splices. Cause wow. we didn't tear those fences down that had been there for centuries. We, we had, had that link there that we'd stick it under there and we had Portuguese men working with a sling. We'd loop it on there and they'd pull that, each section in there and then leave them like that for, the, for our cable splicer to come and, and splice the cable. Mm -hmm. We had a, it was a 29 pair of controls, mm -hmm. leaded and uh, armor guard on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were there from February the 6th until when? Uh, till May the 30th. So you got to, you got to see the seasons change. You got to see yeah. spring there. But the reason I still talk from the beginning, I included Christmas because I, I've told this before, I think. Uh, I stood up in Loop, uh, Grace, uh, Goose Bay, Labrador. We went to a midnight candlelight service on Christmas Eve, 1943. And we came out of there at midnight and stood there and the roar borealis was all around us. You couldn't turn any way that you didn't see it. It just like a fog. You were standing right in the middle of it. It was green and purple and blue and white. And uh, then it came right back the minute we got back to Prescott, Maine, we found out that, that we were on a team that was going overseas. We didn't know where. We thought we was going to England. I did eventually get to right, England. Right, right, right. What was the crossing like on this ship? Was it rough? Uh, well, no, the weather wasn't very bad, but you, you know how that we, we sat there for about well, we were there in first of January, it wasn't the 15th till we left at night one night. Uh, and about one day out, I was on guard duty with my, my, my team and we had to see that everybody kept the shades and didn't smoke a cigarette on that night and all that stuff. But uh, Did you worry about German submarines attacking? Oh yeah, that was the most dangerous place we'd ever been. Yeah, yeah. Well now, were you convoyed by destroyers? Yeah, we had a, we had a, when they broke us off there, one destroyer stayed with us and circled us while we, while we went down the ladder and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they rejoined the thing. There's about 50 in that convoy, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you all get to know the people on the island? Oh yeah. We uh, we made friends with a Portuguese soldier, James J James, and his name is about six inches long. When he wrote it out, I got what I got on my bill. I got to have him sign it. Mm -hmm. And while we were there, we had a, a, a USO show flo flew in, and on it was. Uh, John Garfield was popular then. Oh, an actor. And yeah. I can't think of who the, the lady was. Uh, and then the comedian was Eddie Foy Jr. Right, 
Right. The last of the 84, it just died last year, this year of 2008. Mm -hmm. There were 13 of them. They were all in the show business. You I know. didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, Was that a good morale booster going to that show? Yeah. Yeah. How many Americans were on the island altogether? Do you know? Uh, well, today, the, 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 I took, checked it on the computer, and they claimed it was 2,500 were there. It was, it was, when we got to all this communication up there, it was mostly Navy bombers that was doing the bombing mm -hmm. of all those things. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, how did the communi how did it work? The communication system exactly work? Was it radio? Huh? Was it radio communication? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they had they had radar. Oh, okay. On that too. For the so they could then spot the German submarines and, and yeah. communicate. Yeah. Well, those uh, outfits they they downed more submarines than they did uh, that anywhere it was over there on the edge of Africa, right there around the Cape Cape Verde Islands, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because the submarines over there they'd be going back to refuel. And they try try to travel just underneath the surface, and those, those planes with radar could see them, and then they could actually see the plane. Mm-hmm. 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 Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, growing up in Paducah, did you ever, when you were a kid, did you ever think you'd go to the to the Azores when you were a kid growing up? I think the furthest away from I'd ever been from home was St. Louis, <laughs> in Memphis. Memphis, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, but on December the thirty-first, I was in Goose Bay, Labrador. On uh, February the sixth, I was on uh, Terracera Island. Now, you told me what that meant. Terra it means the third. It was the third island discovered. And I flew from there to, uh, in a, in a C-54 with most of my team to Casablanca. Hmm. That's Africa. Mm hmm I flew from there to uh, London, England. Mm-hmm. Got to London, England on the, uh, June the 1st, four, five days from D-Day. Day. Mm -hmm. Well, the minute I got there, they put me on the orders up to, to Prestwick, Scotland on the British train that, that put the windows up and down on the side of the <laughs> train, train. Scotty. And I was up there when D-Day happened. But I flew back. I flew back from from uh, Casablanca in a Liberator bomber, and on that bomber was Larry Burkhart and uh, Bill Hurst. They were two war correspondents. Oh, sure. They had they had a kind of a real dark green outfit. They were second lieutenants or whatever it was. Yeah. Did you talk to him? Yeah, we. I got him. Got him to sign my short snorter from uh, Morocco, Bill. Uh, Bill Hurst was. Uh, Is that Patty Hurst's father? Patty Hurst's father to right. be. <laughs> right to be. Yeah. 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 And, wow. uh, <clears throat> and I think. I don't. I think John De, John Vandercook was on there too, and he was one of the announcers that announced D Day hmm. officially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, did you ever want to go back to the Azores on a visit? Yeah, that'd be an interesting. Interesting place to see how it's changed. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's predominantly Catholic. In Spanish and Portuguese, but we were fortunate there. We had four, four or five men on the team that 
spoke Spanish or Portuguese, either one. Oh. I had Philip, uh, Theodosio Gomez, he was from New Jersey. He was a lineman. And Ignacio Magana, he was from Nebraska. And um, Her Herminio Boris, I think he was from Colorado. And uh, Felipe Ramirez from New Mexico. They could all, we had them as foremen of the Portuguese there dragging those, those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, and it, that, we had a Portuguese soldier that came around and he uh, took a pineapple and cut it up and soaked it all day in white wine. <laughs> huh. And it brought it to us. And that's great. That was a nice dessert. Yeah. In the time we have left, let me read a letter, which you're very proud of, which came from Robert P. Patterson, who was Under Secretary of War, and it was written to Major General H. C. Ingalls, who was the Chief Signal Officer in the War Department in Washington. And it reads, Dear General Ingalls, it must be as pleasing for you as it is for me now that the war is over to think how the great improvements in communications brought about during the stress of battle can last be put to peacetime use. But for the great strides made in Signal Corps equipment, particularly in radar, the war would certainly not be concluded at this early date. I have some knowledge of the difficult problems you and your staff have solved. I am acquainted as I wish the whole country were better acquainted with the magnitude of your achievement. Please allow me at this time to say thank you for your magnificent contribution to the victory of our nation and our allies. And it is signed, sincerely yours, Robert P. Patterson. In addition to this, you also earned a bronze star for this operation in, uh, in the Azores. Yeah, that was for um, uh, anti-submarine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and, and again, there's no telling how many lives that you all saved on, on Allied ships, both merchant as well as, yeah. as uh, military, with this project. Uh, is this the, the, the proudest thing you did during the war, or was it the going up the Eiffel Tower? Well, 50-50. <laughs> That's a good answer. That's a good answer. Uh, well, maybe one of these days you can go back to the Azores and... and, and Make some, some re reacquaint yeah. yourself with the people in the in the in the island. So, yeah. we're out of time. My guest today was Lewis Chapel of Paducah, formerly of the United States Army Signal Corps in World War II, a, a much traveled veteran of that global conflict. I'm Barry Craig. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.